Welcome to Pretty Lies and Alibis. Let's seek the truth and travel the long road to justice together. What you know, alibiers. Welcome to another episode of Pretty Lies and Alibis. I'm Gigi. Good to have you here. It's already Wednesday. This week's flying by. We're going to jump into day two of testimony in the Ashley Benefield trial. But first, you know the drill. If you're watching on YouTube, don't forget to hit subscribe, like the video, share it with your friends, and you can ring my bell if you want notifications of when I post new content. Click the little bell icon. Music fact of the day. The song In the Air Tonight by Phil Collins has been rumored to be a true story about Phil Collins witnessing someone refusing to help another person who was drowning, but the song's actually a reflection on Phil Collins' personal life and a very painful divorce from his first wife. Let's jump into testimony. The first witness on the stand today was Ashley's mom, Alicia Byers. She explains Ashley started living with her in Florida after she became pregnant. She said Doug told her that she needed to take care of Ashley and that Doug dropped her off. They talk about Ashley having a concealed weapons permit, and her mom said she legally owned two firearms back at the time of the shooting. The state asked if Ashley went to the shooting range with the neighbor who called 911 close in time to the shooting. She doesn't think it was in close proximity to the shooting. They talk a bit about the home in Maryland. Alicia grew up in the home and inherited that after someone passed away. She said Doug was moving up there for his dream job. He was just packing and moving at the same time they were. She said he was there daily for that last week and the day of the shooting, Doug arrived there about 5 p.m. It was still light outside. He showed up as she was leaving to go to the park with the child. Their daughter was around two years old at this point. She said to this day, Ashley has never told her what happened when she shot Doug. On a cross, they point out that Alicia and the baby would go to the park several times a week, typically would wait until evenings when it was cooler, and the park was about a five-minute walk from the house. The next witness, Barbara Russell, she is a licensed clinical social worker and a mental health professional. She's known Ashley since April of 2020. They started out on a professional level, and then they kept in touch after. Subsequent to the shooting, Ashley actually moved in with the witness, her husband, and the woman's daughter, who I believe was 19 at the time. She saw Ashley around 1 a.m. the morning after the shooting. She said Ashley did not discuss what happened and the witness didn't ask. They still have contact to this day. According to the witness, Ashley has never told her what happened the night of Doug's shooting. On cross, they show a photo of Ashley that was taken at the sheriff's office the night of the shooting and asked if she looked like that prior to the day of the homicide. The witness says, no, after the incident, there was swelling to her left eye. They ask if Ashley said she was in pain. The witness said, yes, she complained of pain in her head. The next witness, Lieutenant Dan Dickerman, he is a senior homicide investigator. When he arrived on scene, Ashley was already in the back of the patrol vehicle. He went inside after crime scene did their work. And he saw a blood trail on the floor and also a bullet strike in the bedroom. He knew at the scene this was a self-defense claim. He said Ashley's mom, Alicia, was there and he spoke to her. Alicia handed him a phone and it was Ashley's lawyer on the line. He explained to Ashley's mom that Ashley would be going to the sheriff's office. We know Ashley wasn't arrested right away. The night of the shooting, Child Protective Services was called to the scene. They tried to talk to Ashley's mom, but they said she wasn't fully cooperative. And while she did answer the majority of the questions, they wouldn't say she was cooperative. On cross, they talk about Ashley being in handcuffs in the squad car in a door you can't open that has a cage built in separating that front and back seat. But they say she wasn't under arrest. The defense says, you said an investigation took place before she was arrested. Could have been a homicide that was self-defense. Was that one of the options? Yes. The next witness, Stephanie Murphy, Doug's family attorney. She was hired March 14th, 2018. Doug asked her to draft a letter to initiate discussion about him participating in the upcoming birth of their child. But he also said if Ashley was uncomfortable with him being there, 
He respected her space. That was sent March 15th to Ashley via email. Ashley did not respond to that, and the baby's initial due date was April 8th, but the baby was born March 19th. They didn't know for five or six weeks that Ashley had given birth. Stephanie was actually monitoring the docket for the Manatee court system, and on May 6th, Stephanie saw that Ashley had filed for a restraining order on April 23rd. In the filing, she identified the birth date and the name of their daughter, which Doug did not know either one of those things. When you file for a restraining order, the judge can flat out deny it. They can grant a temporary injunction, but then there's a follow-up hearing. But what happened here was a denial. Stephanie explained there was not enough evidence to give one, but a hearing was set to review that on May 8th. Ashley made a request to continue. Stephanie filed a notice of appearance, and then she and Doug started a separate petition for a parenting plan in order for Doug to have time with his daughter. In the petition Ashley filed, she alleged he hit the family dog, fired a gun into the ceiling. The biggest allegation was that Doug was poisoning her and the unborn baby with heavy metals. July 30th and September 17th of 2018 were the dates for the hearing for Doug to have time with his child. Both sides presented experts. There were toxicologists. Child Protective Services was testifying. They just couldn't squeeze everybody into a one-day hearing. The judge ruled against that restraining order on September 17th, citing a lack of evidence and ruled that Doug could have time sharing with his child. There was an introduction schedule that would increase over time due to the fact he had never met his daughter. Also, Doug would have ultimate decision-making authority over the child's medical decisions and then joint decision-making on everything else. That ruling was immediate for time sharing, and Doug met his daughter a couple of days later. Now, the witness was there when Doug met the baby for the first time, and they did that in the sheriff's office parking lot. At this point, the baby was six months old. The witness got into Doug's truck to wait, and then they saw Ashley arrive with the baby. She said it was an odd interaction and said that Ashley gave her a nasty look, and then Ashley asked Doug if he was dating her. Finally, Ashley approached Doug with the baby, and he got to hold her. They talked for a few minutes. Then Stephanie was told they would be leaving together because Ashley was going to go with them for the time sharing. And that surprised the witness, especially because the litigation was full of what she calls unfounded allegations. She said she cautioned Doug about going with Ashley for this time sharing. And she told Doug Ashley was trying to set him up, but Doug said he was going. Ashley put the car seat in Doug's truck and the three left together. She said after this, it started a time of peace. And on the 26th, Ashley and Doug signed a paper expanding the time sharing that the judge had ordered. Within a week, they agreed he would have more time than the judge actually set. And it also took away that restriction of them having to meet at the sheriff's office. She said the peaceful times lasted about 11 months. And throughout that time, she would see Doug and Ashley in these local magazines attending these gala events together. Ashley stopped speaking to Doug on August 16th of 2019, so Stephanie filed a series of things. And one of the first things she filed was an amended petition for divorce, meaning Doug was now seeking a divorce. It also addressed the parenting plan. By the time these things were getting filed, this was around November. She found out Ashley filed complaints against Doug, which was within a month after he filed for divorce. Ashley filed for another petition to have a restraining order put in place. There was a psych evaluation that was put in place through Child Protective Services. The restraining order petition hearing was continued several times, and the judge ordered Doug and Ashley to go to mediation, which the witness participated in. The state asked about this hearing on September 30th. That's just three days after Doug was shot and killed. September 17th, Doug and Ashley signed a joint motion to release the psychiatric evaluation in the divorce case because at this point, according to the witness, their path forward was that they were reconciling. So the hearing on the 30th would be to release that report and then they would move to Maryland. Doug was killed 
that Sunday night before the hearing was set for Wednesday. She said Doug never seemed angry or aggressive. He was mellow, matter of fact. And she said there was a point of contention between her and Doug because of how mellow he was. On Cross, about the litigation between Doug and Ashley, Ashley files for the domestic violence petition on April 23rd, 2018. She files a petition for divorce and also a termination of parental rights. In that filing, Ashley talks about Doug shooting the gun. And on June 19th, 2018, there is a filing from Doug with his responses. His response to Ashley's allegations, which he denied. Doug had a deposition on July 17th, 2018 about this. They took an early lunch. There was a big issue with the defense. They were looking to impeach the witness. I can just tell you, it was a long hearing and the judge denied it. What was interesting is the judge said that a deputy said an unidentified female came to the lobby and said she's a reporter and had information about the case and wanted to meet with the judge. Well, the judge said he can't meet privately, but they were starting back court at 1230. And this person was welcome to come to the courtroom, identify herself to deputies, and then she would be allowed to talk in open court. The woman said she would not appear in open court at 1230. And that was kind of the end of it. So color me curious. After the judge denied the argument about impeaching the witness, the defense moved for a mistrial and that was denied. The defense says the theory of the state is Doug was killed to prevent the releasing of the psychological report and asked if that's her implication. And the witness says she has no doubt. There's a lot of back and forth, y'all, about this hearing on the 30th and what it was about. The defense is trying to say that the release of that psychological report was not the purpose of the hearing. The witness says it wasn't originally, but after mediation, things changed, and that was the only thing that was going to be discussed on the 30th. The defense moves back to March 14th, 2018, referring to an email she sent Ashley. He hands her paper. She identifies this as a draft. She said the letter she sent was on her letterhead. And the defense asked if this was on Doug's behalf to let Ashley know he wanted to work things out. And the witness said that's not correct. There's nothing about reconciliation. All he wanted to know was she agree to let Doug be present for the child's birth. The defense asked, was there any prohibition from Doug coming into contact with Ashley? And the witness said there was a mutual restraining order out of South Carolina that was in effect. He asked the date that hearing took place. That was November 23rd, 2017, and Doug was there for that. The defense asked if she sent the letter because Doug wasn't allowed to communicate with Ashley. She said maybe that's why he didn't send the letter, so she sent the formal request. The defense asked if Doug sent a package to Ashley in November of 2017. She said that he sent it before the order was signed by the judge, but it was after the hearing that took place. The defense says so after the judge ordered no contact, he sent her a package. The witness said Doug didn't understand what was happening at this hearing. And then she says Ashley was chastised by the court at the hearing for manipulating the system. The defense asked, what about don't contact Ashley? Did Doug not understand? The witness said when he got the order that was signed by the judge, it was after he sent the package. She's asked if Ashley signed a voluntary agreement to participate in that psychiatric evaluation. The witness says she doesn't know what Ashley signed. It either came out of the sheriff's office or child protective services. The next witness is Chris Gilliam. He's with the Manatee County Sheriff's Office. He's a domestic violence investigator, and he became familiar with Ashley in December of 2017 because she reported that Doug violated a restraining order that was in place in South Carolina. Ashley reached out to him again in February of 2018 on a regular basis, and he estimated that she reached out to him 20 or 30 times checking the status of the case and also to see if Doug was going to be arrested for violating that restraining order. A violation of that, they have options. They can make an arrest, no charges are filed, or they can send it to the state attorney's office who will make the decision if there's enough for charges. When Ashley would call, he would tell her the case was still suspended at that point, and when he had an answer, he would let her know. But he said she continued to call repeatedly, at least twice a week. 
He said it was the same conversation, her asking when Doug would be arrested. He said he never told her Doug would be arrested. He decided to forward this to the state's attorney's office and informed Ashley of that. He said she was upset that Doug wasn't being arrested. So he explained the process to her, and she just wasn't happy that the witness was not placing Doug under arrest. He spoke to her again the first week of May 2018, and Ashley told him about a court hearing that was upcoming. So she asked the witness if he would arrest Doug when he came inside the courtroom and to do it in front of the judge when they had this hearing in Manatee County. The witness said Ashley said it would help her custody case. The witness said he told Ashley that absolutely would not happen, and Ashley began to do what the witness calls a hysterical cry. He's still telling her we're not going to arrest him inside that courtroom. Ashley said if the judge sees you arrest him, it'll help me keep my baby. He said they went back and forth for five minutes or so about this with Ashley just asking him to arrest Doug. He kept saying, not going to happen. He said her tone turned from the crying to very aggressive. And she said, you will effing arrest him in front of the judge and I will make sure you do it. He kept saying no, and she started crying again and said something to the effect of, I can't believe you're willing to let Doug kill me and the baby. He said that was different than things she was saying before, but the conversation at this point had been going on for around 20 to 30 minutes, and he said Ashley never computed what he was saying. He said at one point she stopped crying and let out a high-pitched screech. The prosecutor asked the witness if he could make that sound, and he said, no way. He said he couldn't get his voice to go that high. Ashley said, I'll do whatever I have to do to keep my baby, you a-hole. She accused the witness of conspiring with Doug to get her baby taken away. He said he had never talked to Doug about custody. There were two other detectives that were nearby when he was talking to her. He said at this point, he was ready to hang up, but Ashley terminated the call. He said in his 12 years of doing his job, he's never had someone ask for someone to be arrested in front of a judge. On cross, May 31st, 2018, the witness spoke to Ashley about the domestic violence restraining order in South Carolina. The witness wrote three or four supplemental reports on the case. They talk about Ashley going to the Manatee Sheriff's Office to complain about that package that Doug sent her. It was a tea set for her birthday. A deputy who made the report believed there was probable cause for an arrest warrant that was on December 14th. The defense asked if he wrote the first supplemental report on May 31st, 2018, which he did. Then he's asked, did you override the deputy's arrest warrant request? And he said, yes. They asked if he put the case on an inactive status and sent it to the state attorney. He said, yes. June 5th, 2018, the witness interviewed Doug. Doug admitted he sent a package to Ashley. The contents were that tea set. The defense asked if he told Doug he could unfound the case if Doug could send the receipt for the sending of the package. The witness denied that. The defense has him look at the restraining order. The hearing was November 3rd, 2017. The judge did not sign it until the 27th. The same day Doug sent the tea set. Doug was present at the hearing, but the witness says his understanding is that is not officially in effect until the judge signs it. On November 30th of 2020, after the homicide, he contacted the lead detective on that case. 16 days after speaking to that lead detective, there was a third supplemental report. He lists the details of that phone call that we just talked about. Now, the defense points out this supplemental report is two and a half years after the call and asked if he remembers the details and quotes of the conversation, and he said yes. The defense points out he never mentioned one word about that phone call in the supplemental report on June 5th of 2018, and the witness says you're absolutely correct. On redirect, they asked why did he not add that into his supplemental report on May 31st? He said he put in a demand was made that Doug be arrested when he came into the courtroom, but he didn't see anything as a direct threat to Doug at the time of the phone call, and it wasn't relevant to his case. He thought that she was having a massive meltdown because she wasn't getting her way with him. He said it became relevant after the homicide and it needed to be heard, so he reached out to the lead detective. 
The defense asked if the detective asked him to write it, and the witness says no, and I wouldn't take orders from him. The defense asked if he remembered word for word what Ashley said. He said he had never heard something so bizarre in his entire career, so yes. The next witness, Detective Moreland, he is with the Crimes Against Children Division. He shares a cubicle with the last witness, and he was there when the last witness was on that phone call with Ashley. Eventually, he did get involved with Ashley with the Crimes Against Children Division because several investigations came into his department from Ashley about Doug. On December 10th, 2019, the complaint was of sexual abuse against their child at the hands of Doug. He explains deputies go to the scene and take the report, and then they'll investigate if it's warranted. The witness talked to Doug. Ashley had already been interviewed, and the end result was no charges were filed. There were several reports of physical abuse against the child with the allegations pointed at Doug, who, by the way, the child was two years old at this point. Those reports came in on March 21st, 2020, the 23rd of March, April 5th, and April 27th. No charges were filed with any of these allegations either. He said they had a staffing. That's where different groups come together and try to find a way to protect the child moving forward. That's when Ashley and Doug were assigned to that evaluation, according to this witness. On Cross, he points out the reporters of abuse towards the child were not all the same person. The defense says there were three separate people. The witness says he can't say for sure how many there were. The next witness, Dr. Brad Broder, he evaluated Ashley and Doug and started that assessment on June 1st, 2020. His main focus, obviously, what's best for the child. He explains the steps of what he does, which is collateral data, interviewing other people, reviewing documents. So a collateral interview, it's a couple of people for him to contact and do either face-to-face -face interviews or over-the-phone interviews of people who know Ashley and Doug as well as their situation. He was also going to speak to the Manatee Children's Services. He met with Doug and Ashley individually, the two of them together. Sometimes they would exchange their child at his office so he could see how the exchange went. He saw both of them with their child in their respective residences. This went on through the summer of 2020, and he submitted his report September 14th of 2020. He said Ashley never showed hesitation meeting with him and Doug together. He did say she was different when Doug was there and when he wasn't. They would discuss moving, and he said Ashley had every intention to go back to her home state of Maryland, and Doug had connections through the defense department there and kind of saw that as a fresh start to reconcile in Maryland. When Ashley was alone, she did not want Doug to move. That wasn't part of her plan. When she was with Doug, she would just let Doug talk and say what he wanted. The witness says his personal focus was not Doug and Ashley's future. It was the best interest of their child. Doug would say he hoped for reconciliation, and Ashley never corrected him, but would tell him to slow down, take a step back. He said ultimately she would sort of deflect that conversation. Ashley told the witness she was running out of time and needed to move to Maryland. He said she was frustrated with the sheriff's office, child protective services, the courts, the doctor himself, and wanted to know who was going to look out for the child and told him, my life is in shambles. I need this to be over. Ashley admitted she was going to a second round of marriage counseling with Doug, but she was seeing a different counselor. Ashley never used the word reconcile with Doug. And she said to the doctor, she personally had no intention of reconciliation. Ashley and Doug were seeing each other the whole time they were working with this doctor. He said they would go to the movies together. They would go out on dates. Ashley would go to Doug's apartment complex to use the pool. They would go to the beach. She would describe watching Doug with their child and said it was nice to see him playing with the baby. She didn't put Doug on the birth certificate as the father, and he said that was a point of contention between them. They were discussing changing the name to Doug's, but she felt Doug wasn't a fit parent and was using their child to try and reconcile with her. Ashley felt nobody was willing to step forward to protect the kid, and she felt the agencies and Child Protective Services got it all wrong. 
A day or two after the report was submitted on the 14th, Ashley showed up unannounced and wanted a copy of that. He told her she could get a court order to release it because that's the normal way you do it, and he could not give her that. He said Ashley was frustrated and felt thwarted in her efforts. She said she needed to know what that report said so she could move on with her life. Ashley said once she moved to Maryland, she wanted to establish residence for six months, and then she could appeal to authorities in Maryland to try to get full custody and said she would take matters into her own hands. He completed the report for Ashley and Doug. Hers was 27 pages. Doug's was 25. The report was turned over to Child Protective Services on September 14th. Ashley told the witness Doug never physically harmed her. She didn't seem fearful for her safety, only for her daughter's. On cross, the defense asked if Ashley seemingly appeased Doug. Ashley said the best way to deal with Doug was to go along and get along. So according to her, he would not hurt the baby. The defense asked if Ashley was trying to placate Doug. And the witness said he would use the word strategy. She knew he wanted to reconcile and fed into that, given her belief that he may hurt Emerson. The defense asked, did you consider Ashley's position was Doug was only interested in her and not the child? And he said that did come into consideration when he was working on this case. He never said if he concluded it, though. The defense asked if abuse complaints without giving names were initiated by more than the same person. He says yes. The defense says there were three different sources. The witness says yes. The defense asked if Ashley was clear about her frustration with the system as a whole, and he said yes. She said when taking matters into her own hands, it would be petitioning the authorities in Maryland. When asked about angry outbursts, the witness did not find Ashley was prone to that, and he thought she was a good mother. On a redirect, the state points out mandatory reporting is the mere suspicion of domestic violence against a child or elder, and that has to be reported. And they point out if someone goes to you or a pediatrician and alleges abuse, you would have to report it. He says yes. Last witness of the day, Dr. Jason Quintel. He met Doug and Ashley on July 15th, 2020. This was their first visit with him. He was referred by another therapist to do trauma resolution for Doug and Ashley. They met as a couple twice initially, and that ended with individual sessions in between. He met with Doug twice and Ashley four times. In that first session, they did talk about reconciliation, and the goal was to reunify and make that move to Maryland. Again, he noticed Ashley was different with Doug present and with him separate. She was more descriptive of things that happened between the two of them that troubled her when she was alone. Ashley said she was discouraged with the system. Things didn't go her way with the courts, child protective services, and the amount of time it was taking. She was worried about what the psychiatric evaluation would say, and if it was disparaging of Doug, he would be upset and use some form of retribution. He last saw them on September 25th, 2020. That was two days before Doug was shot. They were waiting on that report, which would put forth specific things about how Doug and Ashley would move forward. He understood they still had plans to move to Maryland. On cross, they asked, why was Ashley different with Doug and different without him? The witnesses, Ashley presented she was concerned about Doug's prior acts of violence, shooting a gun. There's an objection which was sustained. At this point, the witness kind of exhales. And the attorney says, oh, you have no idea. Y'all, this judge immediately sent out the jury. The defense says he knows he's about to get a whooping. The judge says that, look, if Ashley's convicted, you or another attorney has the right to appeal every decision I've made since I've sat down through the end of this case. I'm not the first judge who makes rulings you'll disagree with. He said, I hope you haven't engaged in the conduct you just did. It was inappropriate and unprofessional. He said he expects criticism, and he said as a youth sports referee, an umpire prepared him for criticism. But those sorts of side comments are not appropriate. And he said, I caution you not to do that again. They bring the doctor back in, jury's back in, defense continues. 
Did you make any inquiries why Doug would want to stay in the relationship? The witness said he did question why both of them would want to. With Doug, he did bring up in a session that Ashley is saying disparaging comments, and he wasn't sure what he saw as far as moving forward. The witness said he questioned why both would want to. He said he was confused. The defense says, would it be a fair conclusion that Doug was hell-bent on staying with her? The witness said he wanted it to work from everything Doug told him. That witness will be recalled, and that was the end of the day. Y'all, it was so full of objections and sidebars and sending the jury out. It was a crazy, crazy day in that courtroom. This case might be done by now if it weren't for the objections and the sidebars and arguing motions outside the presence of that jury. For me, today was just so hard to follow along with. That's why I'm late getting this out. I went back and listened to some testimony. But so that's it for today. Hope you guys have a good rest of your evening. We'll see you soon.